Hello, remnants out there. Hello, viewers. Thank you so much for joining me again this week. We are digging deeper into self-harm. I'm excited because I have two wonderful, courageous women that um, I just happened to meet online. Thank God for social media, right? Um, and they they have agreed to come on board to um, you know dig deeper into this topic. Last week, we had it from the perspective of a licensed social worker, a therapist who deals with clients um, who self-harm. But this week, this week, um, we are going to have um, personal accounts, which you know I believe uh, uh, you know are great tools because people out there need to know that um, you know people are actually going. They are real people, other than them. You know, going through this. So, you know, without you know wasting any more time, let's get into it. Um, we are going to introduce ourselves. I am going to begin for those who um, may not know me or may not really know about Remnants of Red. And again, my two friends that I just made, um, Jenny and Melissa. Um, mm -hmm. I am Nora Adewumi, and I am from New Jersey, United States, and um, I am the founder of Remnants of Red. Um, my mission, our mission, is basically to see women healed holistically, financially, spiritually, health-wise, relationship-wise, and the avenue that um, we have chosen to, you know, seek that healing is by helping women to find their purpose because we believe that there's power in purpose. And we also believe that there are things, there are barriers that would keep people from healing and finding their purpose. Um, so we are aimed at helping to alleviate those barriers. For example, self-harm. Um, so that is Remnants in a nutshell. Um, you can visit um, our Facebook page, Remnants of Red, for more information. And now I'm going to turn it over to Jenny to introduce herself. And then, Melissa, you take it away. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, do you want a short version or a longer version of the introduction? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how long an introduction you want. Uh, or do, should, should we do a brief introduction and then? Yeah, we could do a brief introduction and then go deeper as we get into yeah. the conversation. I don't, I don't want to just yak away. And Melissa just sat there. That's, that's fine. That's fine. But, oh, you want Melissa to go first? No, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so my name's Jenny, uh, and I'm the founder and CEO of a very small charity in the UK, actually in uh, Leeds in West Yorkshire. So that's uh, north of England. Okay. Uh, it's called Battle Scars. And we've been a charity for two and a half years. We have existed for altogether about four. And we try to support anybody affected by self-harm. Uh, I've been self-harming since I was 13. And when I tell you a bit more about my story, it makes sense why I'm still self-harming and all that. And uh, basically we saw that there was a big lack of support for people who self-harm, for those who support them, you know, the families, friends but there was also a bit of an issue with the professionals that they didn't have much support and much knowledge so um that's yeah i've ended up <laughs> being the ceo of a charity it sounds really posh uh, but funny. actually yeah it, i'm the only staff we are very small and so we rely very heavily on our 35 volunteers mm. well that's that's you know that's there's nothing like taking your story and 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 transforming it into you know like what you did to become a charity um to help others as well we definitely need more people like you and melissa and speaking of melissa you're up next hi everybody my name is melissa McNabb, and i'm based in sydney australia um thank you nora for having me on today this is definitely a topic that i'm passionate about um, I'm the founder of Self Harm Parents, which is an online support space for parents of children who self harm. I founded that group out of my own frustrations of not having any support, not having other parents to talk to. Um, the group's been running for quite a few years now, and um, yeah, we support over 500 families 
in that group currently who are who are dealing with this so I'm really looking forward to getting right into this topic because it's an important conversation to have nice nice okay so self-harming last week we learned that self-harming um is an intentional act where you know people are cutting themselves burning themselves um uh drinking poison uh, basically harming themselves um why don't you go a little bit deeper into that for us um jenny and then melissa you can jump in whenever you feel like jumping in okay sure yeah, I mean, the, the, for starters, yeah, like you said, it's, it's not just cutting. Most people think that cutting is the only form of self-harm. Mm. We Obviously, we support a lot of people. Even the ones who do self-harm will often come to us and they say, oh, I do this. Is that self-harming? And we're just like, well, yeah, you are hurting yourself. It is self-harm. But the intention, you know, that you said it's intentional. It's not always intentional. Uh, a lot of people do it almost subconsciously. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. We, obviously, we support a lot of uh, families with younger kids. So as young as three and five who self-harm. And for them, it's not it's not really an intentional thing. It's just something that they do. And we have obviously people with special needs who, again, there's no intention right. as such behind it. And we have people, you know, they'll just sit there and scratch quite a lot or pull their hair quite a lot and they don't even realise they're doing it. So it's not always something that somebody's aware that they're doing and that the intention can be a bit blurry behind it. But yeah, we're often, you know, it is something that that we do and we know what we're doing kind of thing. You know, we know what we're going to do is going to hurt ourselves. But the, the other thing that, because there's, there's certain things that are not particularly well known, like the, uh, the fact that everybody thinks that we, we self-harm to cope with difficult emotions. Okay. And I think we need to expand that a little bit. It's not just difficult emotions, it's very strong, extreme emotions. There's a lot of For example, what around. kind of what kind of emotions are you are we are you talking about? We're talking about elation, we're talking about you know really happy, we're talking about surprised, nicely surprised, you know, anything that goes on the extreme scale. So a lot okay. of people might manage the emotions there, anything above or below that they're gonna struggle with. So we, we have to kind of understand a little bit more because, you know, most people won't say, oh, I self-harm and I'm really, really happy. And this happened, you know, and I got my test results and they're absolutely brilliant. You know, and everybody like, what the hell? Uh, right. <laughs> Why did you do that? But it's, it's because self-harm is about control. Okay. It, it's not necessarily the relief. It's not all that. It's the control that we get out of it. Why do people use self-harm to punish themselves? They're not getting any relief out of it but they're controlling what happens to themselves where they might be in an abusive relationship and they've got zero control. Okay. They take control of whatever. So okay, so 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 someone could be experiencing, like um, their emotions could be all over the place or they're in a situation where they basically, like for example, with another individual where they're being abused. And so because those are situations where they really, they feel cannot control, they now resort to the self-harming, which in, yeah. which you say is a form of control. It's control. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that's, because everybody thinks about the relief, but it's like, no, it, it's more than that. You know, if because it could be somebody with mental health issues, you know, they're not in control of their mental health, they're not in control of their mood, right. and that True. pushes them to self harm. So it's it's a bit more complicated than a lot of people think. So Sounds it, like it, yeah. I don't think it's safe that we start putting it into boxes mm. because then yeah, we'll exclude a lot of people. Go on, Melissa. I, yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. It's definitely something that is complex and. Um, sorry, I just peed for a second. I couldn't see you. Um, yeah, and especially with children too. You know, when when my first daughter started self harming, she was thirteen and a half, almost fourteen, when I found out about it. Um, you know, and in her case, you like like when I was listening to the talk last week, where there was um, some lead into the fact that 
a lot of initial household trauma and lack of parental connection was a driving force in that sense. You know, that's definitely something that I would contest, I guess. Okay. Um, okay. Because self harm doesn't discriminate whatsoever. Um, you know, when I look at my own children, there, there was no one significant thing that happened. Um, you know, as far as what my daughter was going through at the time, definitely there were elements of control, you know, as which is natural behaviour for teenagers anyway, is they True. want to try and take control of their own life. They're wanting to try and make their own decisions. Um, you know, in her case, there was a lot of her not being able to put a label on her emotions. So therefore, cutting for her was a way to feel something. Um, and it can also become quite an addictive behaviour. So as well as controlling, it's also like an addiction. So I think when there's a very cookie cutter approach to self-harm at the moment, um, and there has, certainly has been in, a, in Australia and a lot of the parents in our group uh, prominently made up from UK, US and Australia. Um, and I think there's still a lot of unknown from health professionals out there as well, especially in the medical field, because they're trying to address it predominantly with medication and there's a lack of understanding and mm, yeah. time spent to get to the root cause and understand, you know, what are the the wounds for that person or what's the behaviour that's happening, you know, and I agree with Jenny as well. We've got a lot of parents in our group who's we've got children as young as nine that are self-harming actively, some with mental health issues. Um, some with quite severe mental health issues, some on the autism spectrum. So there's quite a lot of um, complexity to it, 100%. Yeah. And, and when you've got all of that going on and you're reaching out to so-called health professionals to try to help you figure out how to help your child, um, the resources just aren't there. So what you're seeing now with, with Jenny, um, myself there's quite a few other parents that are creating their own resources and really being the advocates for the for the change that's just really lacking in the system i think that's i think that's very important and again hats off to you ladies because um you know you could have you could have decided to silence yourselves you know to keep this because I, I can't even imagine, you know, one of the things that come to my mind, one of the emotions that I feel come to my mind is probably like shame, you know, which causes people to close up, you know, and I thank you. And on behalf of every woman out there, um, every individual out there that may be engaging in self-harm, we're thanking you. I'm thanking you because you could have, you know, kept it to yourself. You could have, you know, tried to... Deal, deal with it you know yeah thank yeah. you for coming out and speaking about it and 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 turn it in, into a movement you found you saw that there weren't enough resources out there so you took your first hand information and you became the resource and and speaking of of first hand right um what what was going on, if you can remember, what was going on that led you, Jenny, to, um, you know, begin self-harming or um, Melissa that you can probably think of that maybe led your daughter, correct? Yeah, both, both my daughter. Um, yes. Yeah. So, so, I'm happy to speak into that if you like. So, um, you know, there's a there's a lot of life changes between myself, their father, you know, blending new families. You know, there was a lot of life changes happening. Um, so whilst that definitely could potentially be a cause, um, you know, I, I have studied counselling and psychology. I work as a life coach as well. I had a lot of my own skills to draw on. Um, and the, the first instinct for me as a parent when I found out that my daughter was self-harming was I was angry. Because mm. my, my first instinct was I didn't raise you to do this. You know, what? A, you're a very smart girl. You're a really intelligent girl. Why would you do such a thing? And that was my, you know, lack of understanding as to what self-harm was. It was very reactionary. Um, but it's also a very normal response from a lot of parents. Yes, it that. is. Um, you know, so I, ha I was really lucky to have a, a good friend of mine at the time who was a child psychologist. And, you know, she said to me, 
just imagine your child was sitting there on the couch in tears. How would you approach her mm. and approach it like that? So once I, um, you know, kind of shifted my perspective on what she was going through and really started to look at her and what she was trying to do, and she was definitely trying to regain control over her life, mm. um, you know, there were so many emotions for, for me that came up. Um, you know, even though we're well healed, you know, that, that daughter's going to be turning 21 this year, um, you know, the the memory of being too afraid to open her bedroom door every morning in case I found her lifeless, you know, that was my daily reality as a parent. Yes. And it's the daily reality for a lot of parents out there who are experiencing this because there's just so much unknown about it. So, you know, I really did a lot of work on educating myself as to what self-harm was. Um, I really paid attention to what was going on with my child, like what was she really asking me for? Right. And it was really getting control of her own life and, you know, in the Trying end, to I, connect with her, right? Not so much connect with her um, because our relationship had always been quite good. It was just trying to understand her. Okay. At that particular point in time, you know, like she's very high on the academic spectrum. Um, you know, she skipped grades at school because of her academic abilities, you know, so she put a whole lot of pressure on herself, um, you know, which I can see Jenny's nodding. That is quite common with, with a lot of children. That High achievers. That. Yeah. Yeah, which is where, you know, self-harm doesn't discriminate because of that. You know, it's not necessarily... Um, low socioeconomic where there's been really troublesome upbringings you know that's certainly not the stereotype of what what self-harm is there's a lot of like Jenny said high achieving high academic professionals out there that that do it as well um, you know and what I found when I was trying to find other parents to connect with to see well how how are you coping with it um, mm. what tools are you using there was so many parents feeling that shame you know they didn't want to be the parent of the child that cut themselves or you know hit themselves so there was a lot of there and even still there's so many parents um and people suffering in silence with this because of the shame that that comes up so you know i'm really grateful to you and to other organizations that hold space for us to have this conversation because it's Thank so you. important for um you know being that initial advocate for for change so thank I'll you Thank you. Back on. Go ahead, for, for me, yeah, when, like I said, I started at 13. I'm 48 now, still self-harming. Um, and I, because you asked me how it started. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> what I didn't know, obviously, for a long, long time, I only, only found out quite recently, is I got Asperger's. So understanding emotions, processing emotions was always really difficult. At the same time, I do set extremely high standards for myself. Mm -hmm. I have been a high achiever for the things that I was interested in. If I wasn't interested, I didn't bother. But mm -hmm. anything that interested me, I was always a high achiever. And uh, again, a lot of pressure I've always put on myself. Even though my, you know, I had a very uh, stable upbringing, very secure upbringing. Um, you know, I had loads of opportunities. So it wasn't. Again, that's when when I I reached out for help. The professionals were like, well, there's no trauma, there's nothing going on, we can't help you. But mm -hmm. how it first started, um, basically, uh, I got really angry about something. I felt somebody, um, well, somebody laughed at something I said. It was an adult. I took it quite badly. They didn't mean any harm, but right. I took it quite badly. And I felt I was being excluded from that environment where the whole thing happened. And then it just happened that on the way home, uh, you know, because this is like back in 19, uh, 1984, so it's like you used to have these big shops with the TVs in the window and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I walked past and there was this th scene of um, somebody getting really angry. It was like some, some program or something. Somebody getting really angry and he, he punched uh, a glass pane of a window. And my brain went, that's what I want. That's what I need right now. I need the pain. I need the blood that comes with that. That's what's going to calm me down. And that's how it started. 
it was the problem with self harm is that it works. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. it works. It's a quick fix. And the more like you a, like it, a drug. It, yeah, you got an instant result. You know, for me at that point, to go and find somebody to talk to was difficult. Mm. To explain to somebody what I felt was impossible. So those options to me didn't seem possible. I found the option of self-harm. And then the next time I felt like that, well, I remembered about self-harm, so I tried it again. And then, yeah, it becomes addictive because it's a quick fix, because we can get something out of it so quickly, so easily. And we start relying on it and the more we rely on it the less we try to find better ways to cope right and we start forgetting that there's other options and we can't be bothered after that so for, for myself um i didn't have a clue what i was doing had a name until about about 10 years ago so i was already self-harming for 25 years before i knew what i was doing had a name as you can imagine i never spoke to anybody about it right. nobody ever saw anything uh, even my husband, you know, I do a lot of woodwork. I'm actually in my workshop today mm. and accidents happened. So I had ways to explain the injuries. And to be honest, nobody wants to know about self-harm. So nobody wants to suspect it. They'd rather take my lie and accept that mm. because that's just normal. And he's, he's, you know, they don't want to be suspicious about it. Yeah. So I kept it secret for 30 years. I didn't speak to anybody, nobody knew about it. And then, so that was like about five years ago, because I was trying to understand it. I was trying to understand why I was doing it. I was trying to understand what was really yeah. behind it. And I make couldn't get anywhere. It. Yeah, I was trying to make sense of it, because I'm the sort of person that likes to make sense of stuff. Yeah. And while it didn't make sense, I felt I couldn't do anything about it. I tried to stop loads of times. It wasn't working. And then about five years ago, things started making sense. I started just talking to people a little bit more, mm -hmm. uh, more generally. I wasn't talking about self harm yet, but the whole thing started making sense. And at that point, even though I knew I was fully addicted to it, I made the decision to just stop and I made the decision to go cold turkey with it. That was a really bad idea. Uh. Fortunately, I made the decision to also speak about it and try to build the support network because I thought well I'm just about to try to break an addiction here I'm going to need some support so I spoke to my husband I spoke to some friends I started building that support network what I was not expecting was that cold turkey thing to totally destroy my mental health mm -hmm. in about two weeks everything I could not function at all I had to stop working uh, severe depression really bad panic attacks constant panic attacks um it was it just went really really bad and after about a couple of months or so I finally reached out to my doctor the first suggestion was antidepressants i said no things were getting worse because i thought you know like all addictions you manage a few weeks of it it's going to be rough but then things should be picking up i should break the addiction and i should be all right but that wasn't happening nothing was going according to plan basically and um, I reached out to, to, my, to my doctor again. Eventually, I did start antidepressants. And that was another really bad decision. Uh, even though they helped many, many people with me, they caused havoc. They caused me a lot of damage, um, which unfortunately has been permanent. Uh -huh. So um, they made the self-harm urges constant. And I can't switch them off. So that's been going on now for about four and a half years. I don't have a moment where I don't have self harm urges. So how and, are you? How are you uh, coping with it? I had to learn. I had to learn to do it in a completely different way. I had to learn. I had to change my life completely, and I had to learn to cope with depression. I had to learn to cope with anxiety, and unfortunately, I had to learn to cope with suicidal thoughts, which is what the medication caused and again that seems to be permanent and you know because a lot of people think you know okay so when you were 13 with the whatever maturity I had at the time self-harm served one purpose but when I was 20 self-harm served another purpose because wow. it mutates it, it mutates and it follows us 
you know, because that was my coping method. That's what I was using. It was adapting. So, how did you the, go on? No, I was, I was, I didn't know if you were done because I was going to ask um, Melissa how, mm. how was she coping or dealing? First of all, are your daughters still undergoing self harm? And, you know, if so, how are you? dealing with it as well from a parental aspect. Thank you, Jenny, for your, your input as well. There's so many amazing things in what Jenny just said that I'm, I'm really hoping that parents can take away to help understand their child because, um, you know, when my, my daughters first started, and they started at different times, so obviously when my first daughter started self-harming, there's 18 months difference in age between my my older two daughters and when the second one saw that the first one was getting so many leave passes for so many things she was getting away with so much stuff um you know as a parent because there was so much misunderstanding for me I didn't want to upset the apple cart so everyone in the house was treading on eggshells you know parental mm. discipline went out of the way you weren't quite sure what the triggers were um you know and at that time as well you know my my daughters were they didn't have smartphones none of our children have had smartphones until they've had a job and been able to pay for them themselves um because we wanted to limit that online access mm. um but they've both talked about the trend amongst teens around self-harm like there's a very big trend around doing it um, it's a rite of passage at the moment it is unfortunately, you know, due to celebrity as well, um, you know, in the negative sense, there's a glorification around it. Um, there's also a glorification around taking antidepressants and things like that. It's almost like if you're not yeah. taking them these days, you're the odd, the odd one out. And, you know, for, for me, the parental advice was, you know, go to the GP, get a referral to a psychologist, psychiatrist. Um, you know, so I did that, took the children at their very stages to that to try to work through, you know, the underlying things, teach them different coping mechanisms, help understand and unlock some of those um, inner things that as a parent I wasn't aware of but was hoping that they might be able to figure out. Um, you know, and the girls just ran rings around them and all they wanted to do was medicate them. I was like, I'm not putting my children on antidepressants. Like, that's not an option for me. I know how hard they are to get off as an adult, so I'm not going to put my children on those. Um, you know, so it was me then just drawing on all of the skills that I learned studying psychology and counselling myself. And, um, you know, I'm a very big fan of the work of Dr. Marie Montessori and that educating method. And I was just drawing on every single skill and tool that I had to look at my children. And I, I just came back to, you know, if you give them everything and the right tools, the right environment, they can figure it out for themselves. Mm. So, you know, I, I got to the point after the last psychologist we saw, we went to about three or four different ones, ended up sacking my daughter as a client because you know we really she was taking the piss we got the to the point where you know she was just using it she was turning up because she had to she wasn't doing the work no she um, wasn't okay. that loop was happening um you know after a couple of years of it as, as a mum I just had enough I'd had enough of putting the family on eggshells I'd had enough of you know, questioning everything. So I just sat down with her and I just said, look, you know, I absolutely love you unconditionally no matter what and this is your life and I'm trusting you with it. And mm -hmm. whatever you choose to do with it, even if that means no longer being with us, I love you anyway. And mm -hmm. I just handed 100% control over to her and that's when something shifted. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it was, I, I knew on my part it was a huge gamble to do that and it was, as a parent, one of the most difficult conversations I had with my child because, you know, as, as a mum, you kind of think, well, once my children leave home, then I have to let them go. I wasn't expecting to have to let my child go at such a young age. And Can, can I know, ask how old she was at the time? She was almost 15. Mm. Yeah, almost 15. You know, she's, she's going to be turning 21 this year. No, she's not self-harming. Um, to my knowledge, she's, you know, got, got quite a, a good life for herself. She's, um, you know, works full time. My other daughter, 
um, she she didn't and she had a relapse last year after she was sexually assaulted so that brought up a whole lot more trauma for her and she she did turn to that for for a brief period but she was also very self-aware and didn't want to go back down that rabbit hole so you know she really made a conscious effort to choose other things um, so it sounds like it's it sounds like Melissa, your testimony plays into what Jenny spoke about about the whole control, uh, the control thing that um, you know kind of leads people into um, self harming. You know, wow, that 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 must have taken everything to just like stare. It's basically staring, you know, staring that situation in the face you know, and like you said, taking a big gamble and, you know, having that conversation with your daughter and basically, you know, letting her know, listen, you do have the, con you have the control. It's up to you now. And then you said that's when, that's when like there was like a, a turning point. So I th that control uh, um, that is desired that is a huge thing. That's a huge thing that I'm I'm really picking up on when it comes to self harming. Um, what? Okay, so that was one from a parental aspect, Melissa. One of the things that you know I know I'm going to take away, you know, to you know when it comes to dealing with this, if if I ever you know come up against uh, self harming, is to you know first of all have a conversation with your child, right? So at, at this point, I want to I want to talk about those tips on how the advice on how to handle self harming when you know if you are to ever. Well, I think the first, first thing that I would suggest is acceptance. Mm. You have to start with acceptance which is obviously what Melissa did various stages and more and more and more. Because if you don't accept it, then you're either pushing it underground mm. or you're making them feel really ashamed or you're taking more control away from them. Mm. Unfortunately, quite often the advice that parents get as soon as they find their child cutting and they get it from professionals all over the place is hide all the sharps, hide all the knives, hide all this, hide the other. Mm. There's millions of sharp things all over the place. We had this case with a 10-year-old, she was using some little uh, scissors at school, and you know school scissors, they're not sharp, are they? Yeah. And the school were told, hide all the scissors. So then she found a piece of broken glass in the street, and she mm -hmm. used that. You know, and, and we, we, our brains get extremely inventive when we get desperate. Mm. And it comes to the point mm -hmm. where you get so desperate that the self-harm becomes really dangerous. Because you'll pick whatever piece of rubbish you find that you've never used before. You don't know how sharp it is. You don't know how dirty it is. You don't know whatever about it. it can cause yourself some real damage. So instead of trying to take more control away from people, that trust, that acceptance, that makes a huge difference, shifts things around. The whole idea is to, to, to help that person, whether it's a child or whether it's an adult, to just feel they can trust you a little bit. Yeah. They can drop their guard a little bit and you can start working on it. Otherwise, you're just going to be going around in circles. And like I said, something that we see very often is, let's say, somebody's cutting and some parent says to them, oh, promise me you're never going to do that again. And this poor person wants their love, wants their acceptance, so they promise. And then how long are they going to hold this back? Right. There's no other better options. It's not like they've got the strategies in place. They haven't got anything else to do instead. And quite often what we see is that, yeah, they've stopped cutting and then they developed an eating disorder. Mm. Which, to be honest, is so much more dangerous than cutting. Mm. You know, and there's, they're finding different methods. So they, they stop the cutting and they start drinking bleach because wow. that doesn't show as easily. It right. doesn't leave the scars, the obvious scars, you know, it causes far worse damage than that. But so it's, it's you know, the acceptance is the start of it. The, you know, the, these are the two things that I feel that anybody who's listening to this, you know, from what I'm saying is that, yeah, acceptance is the way to, to start working on it and the control issue. 
like Melissa said, yeah, it is a big, it is addictive. It is very problematic. It's a very difficult addiction to break. It is something that we're working on. We have developed uh, an addiction program for self-harm, which mm. will be available over the next few months, hopefully. And it does look at it fully from, from that kind of view, that kind of point. Thanks. Melissa? Yeah, you know, as a, as a parent, um, you know, looking, looking back, um, you know, per parent self-care is a huge thing. You know, you've really got to look after yourself. Um, you've really got to redefine the paradigm of what parenting is, you know, and in, in my coaching mm -hmm. work, that's something I do quite a lot of, um, you know, as parents for generations, you know, society has programmed us to self-sacrifice. All the focus has to be on the children. Um, you've got to fix your children. You've got to fix everything. If you can't fix it, you've failed. You know, a lot of those feelings definitely did come up for me. So when it comes to self-harm, I think it, it is really accepting. It's not something that you can fix. Um, mm -hmm. It's really being observant of your your child and, and stepping back and really looking at it from that perspective, disconnecting. You know, I think um, one of the, the biggest things I learned from that as a parent was learning when to hold on and when to let go. Mm. And, you know, as, as parents, especially when we see our children hurting, all we want to do is hold them tighter. We want yeah, to bring yeah. them closer and we want to, we, we want to fix them because, you know, when they were two or three and they fell and they scraped their knee, that's what we did. We <laughs> fixed it, you know, made them feel better. Um, but this isn't something that has the same effect, you know. So there was a lot of helplessness that I, I really felt as a parent, a lot of parents feel because of that, because they're so stuck in the role of parents so I think you've really got to detach from that role of, mm -hmm. of a parent and just really meet them human to human and you know for me it was accepting that my children are here on their own journey through mm -hmm. through this life and yep. you know they've got to learn their own their own lessons and you know it's my job to hold space for them to be able to do that and that was something that drawing on all of my other skills that I was able to to do and in in our case you know that's that's what worked um you know i don't know whether that's something that would work for everybody but it's just something that i would en encourage people to experiment like stop approaching it like a parent right. um because right. it's not something you can you can fix and yeah. you know when you continue to approach it like a parent there's so many other parental battles that happen especially with teenagers you know that you've got to understand their natural evolution as teenagers and what they're naturally trying to do plus navigate those those extra things and um you know we've got another lady who's also uk based jenny i'd love to connect you with her she does a lot of work around addiction um and she was the first person to suggest to me to approach self-harm as an addiction yeah. so you know it's really nice to see that jenny you're exploring something more yeah. specific to that because you know the cookie cutter approach um of, of the medical profession it just is not working and no. you know in the world that we live in it's certainly not okay with me to have any children self-harming um right. you know let alone but, that, yeah. that continuing on and you know if there's a way that we can find early intervention and yes. you know t teach better better coping skills you know and at the same time you know as a parent well, as a human in general, you can only ever give that which you are at the time, you know. And right. everybody thinks that parents have to know everything and fix everything. But at the end of the day, we're just women and we're just men. And we've transitioned into that role of parenthood because we've we've chosen to, to birth a human being. And, um, you know, I think really coming back to the essence of that is a, a good way forward and continuing these conversations and exactly. taking away the shame and you know in, encouraging people to exactly. feel yeah. feel comfortable enough to start talking about their journey and know that there is help available whether you're a parent or whether you're somebody that does self-harm and whether you're a child or whether you're an adult mm -hmm. um you know just just knowing knowing what's available that's yeah that's something that we see so much you know the the yeah the young people who become adults and we support hundreds and hundreds of them where if we was caught early if they'd had that support early 
we wouldn't be supporting so many adults with self harm. Yes. Yes. You know, but because we th there is a lot of shame. We did a specific because we, we we did that for for a spell. Uh, we're going into schools and we're inviting in the school. We're inviting the parents in the area whose kids self harm or who wanted to know a bit more about it. And we went into a school where there was a big issue with self harm, and they invited hundreds of parents nobody turned up mm. nobody but then they sit there and complain that there is no support and you're thinking you have to overcome this stigma you have to get past yeah. it you have to just you know you, you were going to be in a room full of other parents who were in exactly the same boat as you you had an opportunity there to connect right did not feel on your own anymore and they didn't take it because the stigma is still too big, because we're not talking about it, because everybody's ashamed of having a child with self-harms. And then obviously those children are going to be ashamed that they do self-harm. Mm. And we're just going round and round in circles, because that shame feeds the self-harm. It's going and to make it feel worse. Call it is, and a, a good way to get a gauge of the accurate numbers is to go and talk to a school principal. You know, mm. like when... Um, and they're not accurate. They're no, not they're not. Accurate. Once my daughter... Um, yeah. When I discovered that, obviously, I went to talk to her principal because there were certain things at school that were a little bit difficult. You know, she might need to leave the classroom. She might need to do these things. And, you know, when I was made aware of the number of children that they knew about within the school that were self-harming, the first thing I asked was, can I talk to the other parents? I want to I want to connect with them. I want to see what they're doing. Um, because of privacy reasons, they weren't allowed to give that information yeah. out and they weren't willing to hold anything for the community and that was how I started the self-harm parents group it was almost that if you build it they will come mm. you know? and mm. it's definitely it is, growing yeah. slowly but um you know slowly more and more people are that you know they're, they're still searching there's still new parents joining every single day there's still people you know googling how do I fix this or where's the support for parents so coming together yeah. and yeah. Yeah, here we found that, you know, a child um, gets passed on to mental health services, they get the referral, they get taken on by mental health services, parents get left out. Yeah, They don't get any support, they don't have a clue what's going on, nobody's trying to explain anything to them, they just get left there, not knowing what to do. Yeah. And then we have parents who behave differently at home and the school treats it differently and then the professionals treat it differently. Can you imagine how confused right. this yeah. Yeah, they like don't know. Yeah, so we, we, we're trying, we're apart from um, supporting people to self harm because we've got a closed Facebook group, we've got two and a half thousand members in the group, and some are parents, so we do support them that way. We do sessions for parents, we're going to start doing virtual groups probably for parents, which is something that we haven't decided yet. And we put loads of resources on the website, some are for parents, some are for them to sit down and work with their children together, mm -hmm. and we do train the professionals as well because wow. quite often they just learned something out of a book that's 40, yeah. 50, 60 years old, put all the sharps away and tell people to use elastic bands and ice cubes, which is a lot of rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> elastic bands and ice cubes don't really solve anything and they basically are self-harm. We just tell them to use an acceptable form of self-harm instead of what we don't like and makes us upset. Yeah. So they're not a solution. There's much better things that you know, we can suggest to, to anybody who self harms much healthier ways to manage stuff. But they need the acceptance, they need the support network, they need people who will go through stuff with them, you know, whether they're self harming or not. Because quite often it's like, oh, when everything's going well, you've got loads of friends around you. As soon as things turn nasty, as soon as depression yeah. kicks in, as soon as the self harm increases or anything like this, and like, all these people just disappear. So it's yeah. not a proper support network because people are scared and don't understand. Uh, so being able to, to have this opportunity, so thank you for it very much. It's really great to be able to reach more people and help them understand. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much again, uh, Melissa, Jenny, for coming on. Um, you know, we can go on and on. I would love to go on and on about this, but I think it's even more important that we just continue the conversations, you know, 
wherever we are. You know, um, you can find Melissa. She has a, a Facebook group called Self Harm Parents, um, and then Jenny. You can find her organization, uh, Battle Scars Self Harm, also on Facebook. And I would just love for this conversation to continue because I think the biggest thing that I got out of this to that will help everyone is speak out. Do not be ashamed. Accept it. You are you are still someone. You are still loved. You are still an individual. Speak Can I say out. sorry to interrupt? Speak up, but if you do self harm and you haven't opened up to anybody do be careful who you're going to open up to. Mm, key. Because if you get a bad reaction, you're not going to open up again. Mm. So, and if you're going to open up just a meeting little bit so you can gauge the reactions, slowly build the trust. Don't just go and just spew everything at somebody because people will panic as well. Mm. You know, so mm. we, yeah, well, but, you know, the general population, we need this topic out there more. So, yeah, in that respect, definitely speak up about it. Right. So you 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 remnants of red is speaking up. Battle scar self harm is speaking up. Self harm parents speaking up. Also, you can um, Melissa is also a a life coach. So courageouscoaching.com. Visit get some resources out there and. I am going to continue as much as I can to stand alongside you ladies to promote, you know, this uh, this movement. Because again, it's about freeing as many people as we can. And I thank you so much. We are we are running out of time, but again, you can visit visit Facebook, self harm, parents, battle scars. Uh, self harm on Facebook. Get more information. Like Jenny said, we we want you to speak up, Melissa. We want everyone to speak up, speak up but be wise about it. But we do want you to find someone, get the resources. They are out there. And again, if you don't know where to go, if you don't know who to talk to, we have two women here that are being three. Okay, because you can reach out to me as well, and we will get you the resources. Until then, Until then, you are loved, and I am praying for you. Like I was telling Jenny before we came on, that is uh, um, something that I've just been doing, meaning that I have basically no control. I cannot fix it, but one way that I can play my part is alongside speaking and partnering with women like you is to pray about it as well. So until then, be safe, be well, and again, reach out. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Jenny. We will definitely be linking up again in the future. And um, we can definitely brainstorm on how we can you know, all partner to um, come against this uh, issue. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll pop my links in the comments underneath the yes. video for you. I'm definitely going to share the information with a, 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 okay. a follow -up. That's what I like to do. So um, you can send the information to me, and I will send it out there so that they can link up with you ladies. Okay, perfect. And just before we jump off, I just want to acknowledge um, from Australia everything that's happening in the U.S. right now with the African-American community. We're with you. Um, that's definitely one issue that the world cannot accept anymore. Mm. And, you know, um, big love to, to all of you out there and you've definitely got the support of the world. So hopefully that's enough to make the changes stick. Thank you so much for that, Melissa. Thank you. Because there's nothing like, there's nothing like feeling like um, uh, uh, we are united. You know, it's one thing like you, it's one thing for an individual a uh, race or an individual themselves to go through something, but to know that there are other people out there that, um, you know, that, what can I say, that feel us, you know, that are, you know, thinking about us, praying for us, encouraging us. That is a blessing and a reason to, you know, continue another day. So thank you so much for um, that message, Melissa. 
So until we all meet again, ladies, stay safe. Bye. Bye.